Earlier this week, the orange ribbons, symbol of our solidarity with First Nations communities reeling from remembered pain and grief, were untied from the tree outside St. Paul's. The words we remember and lament were removed from the church sign. And yet again, we are lighting a candle to remember the hundreds of children whose unmarked graves have been discovered, this time by the Coasses First Nation at the site of the former Marieville Residential School in Saskatchewan. The emotions evoked in us are profound. Grief, shame, anger, pain, it's hard to know what to do with those feelings. This week I've had conversations with people who have expressed shock because they simply didn't realize, or frustration because what can we do, or powerlessness because it can't be undone. But I think it would be a mistake to give in to those feelings. There is so much that we can do we can be intentional about learning, about hearing the stories and respecting the storytellers. We can adjust our perspective, own up to our white privilege, and own up to the failures in our church history and our national history. We can make it a point to actually read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's reports and findings and 94 calls to action. We can read to understand the Robinson-Huron Treaty Agreements of 1850, the treaty to which we are still partners. We can make the path to right relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people part of our everyday concern. We can talk in support of Indigenous brothers and sisters rather than criticizing them. We can recognize that generations of pain and trauma, as well as enormous gifts and abilities, are part of the narrative of First Peoples. This may well be a time for continuing lament and grief. Most certainly, it is a time for solidarity and compassion. May it also be a time for hope. And may God be with us as we journey. In that hope, I light the Christ candle.
We yearn for communion with the Holy One in this time of worship. May we, may we be drenched in the new life that pours from God. May the star abiding one come to us and dwell with us. Let's pray. God, you are known to us in many ways. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Mother and Maker and Creator. Christ, Redeemer and Healer. Energy and Light and Comforter. We name you in many ways, Holy One, knowing that you are holy mystery and holy love. Come to us in this worship gathering, we pray. Let this time together be a story about you, O oh God, showing up. Amen. Our hymn is number 343 in Voices United, 343, I Love to Tell the Story. friends. I've got a book here that I think I've read with you before, but I, it's been a while. It's called God's Quiet Things. Today we're thinking about how God comes to us, sometimes in silence. So the first picture is of the little boy flying his kite outside, probably noticing the wind, right? 
And he says to his kitten, shh, listen. Listen for God's quiet things, like butterflies with velvet wings or raindrops making quiet rings on water. Listen, can you hear a sound from worms that wiggle underground? Or any noise from fish that swim in ponds that lilies blossom in? Up high against the blue, blue sky, a quiet cloud is drifting by. Grass is waving in the breeze, or leaves just moving in the trees. Look and listen high and low. God's quiet things are yours to know. Fluffy weeds grow seeds to share and send them sailing through the air. To gardens where the sun shines in, where inchworms inch and spiders spin. Do you hear the darkness fall? The morning dew that comes to call? Night comes, day comes, up so high the sun and moon cross through the sky. Look and listen everywhere. God's quiet things are always there. Do you hear them? Listen. Our responsive reading today is Psalm 20, which you'll find at number 742 in Voices United. Psalm 20. May God answer you in the day of trouble and the name of God defend you. May God send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from the holy mountain. May God remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifices. May God grant you your heart's desire and give success to all your plans. May we rejoice in your victory and triumph in the name of our God. May God fulfill your every wish. Now I know, O oh God, that you help your anointed and will answer from your holy heaven with the victorious might of your right hand. Some put their trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of our God. They will totter and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. God, save those who rule and answer us when we call. Our scripture text today is from the Old Testament, the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 to 15. It's a story about the prophet Elijah. King Ahab told Queen Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But Elijah himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die, saying, it is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then Elijah lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. 
He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came to Elijah a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now, there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, He wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Elijah, go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Did you pick up on that lovely phrase in that Hebrew scripture reading that comes across in the NRSV translation that I like to use? A sound of sheer silence. Isn't that beautiful? I also think it's kind of interesting that Elijah heard it the sound of sheer silence. I was really tempted to entitle the sermon that, a sound of sheer silence, if only for the poetry of that phrase. And a good many sermons preached on this passage have focused on exactly that phrase and the idea that God comes to us most profoundly in our moments of quiet communion with the holy. As I say, I was tempted. It would be a straightforward interpretation of this passage, and I could find lots to say about what a good idea it is to find Sabbath time and listen for God in the sound of sheer silence. It would be a really good sermon for me to hear because I'm not very good at just being still and would actually sound like a normal sermon. But I'm calling this reflection a story about God showing up. And what I'd like to do with this Bible text this morning is tell it again with a little bit of background context and a little of my own creative spin, and then let the story work its magic in us as we find our own places of entry into it. Here's some background. In this passage, we find God's prophet Elijah climbing up the holy mountain to commune with God. And instead of God showing up in the usual and expected fashion, like in a mighty wind, in a shuddering earthquake, in a raging fire, God waits for that moment of utter quiet. Much to Elijah's surprise, I suspect. And then God speaks. Well, you can't really blame Elijah if he might have been expecting God to appear in a big, loud way. After all, just recently, Holy Presence has been demonstrated in big, loud ways. Let me recap. In the preceding chapter of the book of Kings, just before today's story, Elijah, who is prophet of the one true God, Yahweh, has had a major standoff with some other prophets, the prophets of Baal. They all gathered around the community altar and first the prophets of Baal prepared their sacrificial bull and performed all their rituals, calling on their God Baal to send fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice. And nothing happened. All day, nothing happened. 
except that those poor misguided prophets of Baal were limping and sweating by the end of the day. Then Elijah, full of holy confidence, prepared a water-filled trench around that same altar, thoroughly soaked everything, and called on Yahweh to consume the sacrifice. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood, the stones, and the dust, and even licked up the water that was in the trench. Yes, God was definitely present in that raging fire. And God was present in wind and storm too, because right after that big event at the altar, Elijah says to King Ahab, miserable, depressed, hopeless King Ahab, he says, oh, by the way, my king, you can get up off your couch of despair and reclaim your appetite and drink as much water as you want, because guess what? The three and a half year drought and famine that we've had as punishment from God for being unfaithful by worshiping Baal, it's over. I've been praying and now I see a teeny little cloud in the sky over there and I'm telling you to get ready for a major downpour. And sure enough, God comes through in a big loud way. The story tells us that in a little while the heavens grew black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. Yes. God was definitely present in the mighty wind. Clearly, God is to be encountered in the great forces of nature, as well as in the sound of sheer silence. At least, that's how the story goes. In fact, maybe this story isn't so much about where and how God shows up, as it is about reminding us that God always shows up, regardless of where we look for God and perhaps regardless of whether we look for God. Elijah's behavior in this story of epiphany, which means God encounter, his behavior is intriguing. Remember, he's just had a couple of epiphanies in big, loud ways, right? God in the fire and God in the storm. And notably in all of this, God on Elijah's side. Elijah is full of holy confidence. It's so clearly evident that Yahweh is the one true God, and that Yahweh listens to the prayers of Elijah, God's faithful prophet. Everybody has seen the proof, and any prophet of Baal that has managed to escape the holy slaughter that followed hard on the heels of that altar showdown must be cowering in some cave in the hills. But wait, <laughs> actually, it's Elijah who's heading for the hills big, brave Elijah who faced down 450 prophets of Baal and said to them, I'll show you a God. Why is Elijah running? Because big, brave Elijah has heard a vicious little rumor that King Ahab's wife, the pagan Queen Jezebel, has a contract out on his life. Jezebel wants revenge for all those martyred prophets of Baal, and so Elijah gets out of town fast. And that's why in today's reading we find God's mighty prophet trudging alone through the wilderness. Despondent, afraid, exhausted, Elijah walks until he drops. And there, slumped on the ground under the broom tree, he starts his lament. Now it's enough. Now, oh God, you can take away my life. I can't take any more of this, and I don't have it in me to keep going. And then, exhausted from his lament, Elijah falls asleep under the tree. And God's response? Well, God shows up. In the form of an angel, God shows up when Elijah wakens and gives Elijah what he needs in that moment. Some freshly baked bread and a long, cold drink of water. After three and a half years of drought and famine, this is what Elijah needs. He eats and drinks his fill and then lies down and falls asleep again. God is patient. God waits until Elijah has rested as much as he needs to. It's hard work being a faithful prophet. It's hard work standing in resistance to the powers of evil and oppression. Elijah is very tired. And God lets Elijah have a break. 
When Elijah reawakens, the angel of God serves him another meal and another drink. Elijah is going to need this. Apparently, his prayers are not going to be answered this time. He's not going to die. God is not going to take his life. God is putting him back out on the road. Elijah is greatly strengthened. He has a new lease on his spiritual life. He's so strong now that he can go for 40 days and 40 nights, and he actually makes it to God's holy mountain. The place of ultimate epiphany, right? The place to meet with the holy. This is the same sacred mountain where Moses met with God. Elijah climbs that mountain, every step bringing him closer to, to what? Some answers? Some direction? Some sympathy? Some assurance that God is still with him? Whatever it is that Elijah is seeking, God seems to know. And God shows up. After Elijah has had a good night's rest in the shelter of a cave, God has something to say to Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? What? Elijah's head must be spinning. Is he still dreaming? What am I doing here, God? Well, I'm your prophet, God, your faithful prophet. I'm the only one who's kept the faith. All your people have fallen away and all your prophets are dead. I'm it. And Queen Jezebel is hunting me down so you won't have anyone left to worship you or serve you. Oh. Well, actually, God doesn't seem to be too phased. God simply says, Elijah, get out of this cave and go stand outside in the fresh air and be ready for holy presence to pass by. I wonder what Elijah is anticipating. I wonder if he's still looking for God to show up in the usual ways, like wind and earthquake and fire. Even after those quiet, refreshing meals and gentle sleeps, Elijah seems to be a little stuck in the familiar, right? He's singing the same tune every time God asks the question of what he's doing there. And Elijah actually doesn't come out of his cave right away. He just stays inside and listens to all the commotion from his place of safety and security. It sounds extremely terrifying out there. Chunks of rock splitting off and thundering down the mountainside. The wind howling and battering against the cliffs. Wildfires raging and coursing in all directions. Who wouldn't stay huddled inside? Especially when God hasn't been in any of that wild commotion. The Lord is not in the wind. The Lord is not in the earthquake. The Lord is not in the fire. The Lord is not in any of the expected places. But that doesn't mean that God is not there. God shows up. In the sound of sheer silence, God shows up. And Elijah, from inside the cave, knows it when God has arrived. Wrapping his face in his cloak, Recognizing that he is on holy ground, Elijah slowly leaves the cave for the fresh air and the silence from which God speaks. What are you doing here, Elijah? What? That question again? What am I doing here, God? Well, I'm your prophet, God, your faithful prophet. I'm the only one who's kept the faith. All your people have fallen away and all your prophets are dead. I'm it. And Queen Jezebel is hunting me down so you won't have anyone left to worship you or serve you. Oh. Well. Actually, God doesn't seem to be too phased. God simply says, Get down off this mountain, Elijah. It's time to get back to work now. I want you to go anoint a new king and go anoint a new prophet. Oh, and by the way, in case you're interested in the facts, you are not alone. There are at least 7,000 people in Israel who are faithful to me and who have not bowed down to that false god, Baal. Come on now, put your sandals on and get out there and do your prophet thing. And so Elijah set out from there.
We respond to God's invitation to give as we would to an intimate friend from whom we would withhold nothing because of the love and regard between us. That is how we give. Loving God, accept all our gifts as thanksgiving for your beautiful presence and your many blessings. Please use our gifts to welcome all your people into the circle of your love and grace. Amen. During this time of the prayers of the faith community, I'm going to ask if we could all just hold silence for some moments as we remember the children as we affirm by our silence a sense of solidarity with those who are hurting and affirm that every child matters. And after we've had some silence, I'd invite you to join with me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray for the kingdom to come for every one of God's children. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 657 in Voices United. He leadeth me, 657.
Sisters and brothers in faith, may the love that brought you into being fill you with hope. May the peace that passes understanding be upon you. May the joy that lives where justice is be alive in you. Amen.